Our reading today is about the law of karma, which is really one of the single most important principles for us to understand to live successfully in this world and especially on the spiritual path. There's a handful of them, and karma is absolutely one of them. Uh, Most suffering in life comes because people don't have an understanding of what karma is and the perpetuation of our exile from perfect bliss is the exercise, the continual unrolling of that karma. It's not at all simple to see. At the end of the reading today it says, you know, um, it's too complex to be just rolled out like a single thread. And so I was trying to, um, I'll try, to give some ideas that have helped me over many years to understand it. There's a a phrase that Swami has offered us on occasion and he says, after all of our many, many lifetimes of striving and effort and aspiration and involvement and disappointment and fulfillment, he says, all karma in the end must come back to zero. Um, I found that always to be so depressing that I did my best to forget it and then, unfortunately, he would bring it up again and again Um, And he would just say it very powerfully, it all comes back to zero, which, I mean, the first impulse with that is, I'll just, I just won't get out of bed. I'll just stay in bed. It's really comfortable here. If it's all going to come back to zero, maybe I'll just do nothing and that'll hasten the zero. Um, The action in inaction in inaction in action relates to that. And I may or may not come back to it. We'll see what happens. But the coming back to zero one tends to do it, I have tended to do it mathematically. So if I have a certain number of happy days, that means I have to have a certain number of unhappy days. And so I think it makes you very nervous because every time you're enjoying anything or any time anything begins to go well for you, you just wait for the coming back to zero to start happen. And it just, it doesn't, uh, who would ever be on the spiritual path? You'd have to be really stupid to embrace the philosophy like that. And we're not, and the masters are not, so there has to be another way to see it. Um, Because the end of the story is not uh, sadness, but bliss. The end of the story is not um, discouragement, but um, a completely optimistic, positive attitude. So you have to keep weaving the philosophy around until it it makes common sense as well as Vedantic sense. So um, I remembered uh, another event with Swamiji, which when he was, uh, as it happened, he was talking at the ashram in India, um, mostly to the ashramites, and he made the statement that because creation is so complex, we tend to think that the source of all of this creation must be the most ultimately complex that there is. But he pointed out that the complexity is created because of all the, the alternating vibrations. And that if you go all the way to sunrise and then all the way to sunset and all the way to birth and all the way to death, all the way to happiness, to sadness, all of them, and cover all the gamut in between, you can see how many complex nuances of experience there are. But all of those vibrations emanate from a single source. This is the fundamental principle of spiritual life, that we, this whole manifestation comes from source, that source being spirit. And the Swami said, the closer you get to the source, the smaller the arc of movement, and so actually the simpler everything gets, because it's all very close together, and ultimately it doesn't move at all. That's why Jesus said, suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say, suffer the great scholars who have the most information, because that's what it's made out of. Little children, what is the nature of little children? Well, they're very simple. They don't have a lot of um, intellectual complexity. They have intelligence and full consciousness. But there's a simplicity to the way they approach everything. And that's what... Jesus was trying to get us to understand. The next morning, Swami made that statement uh, in an evening satsang, and the next morning over breakfast, he said, I wonder how many people appreciated 
how vitally important what I was saying was last night. And then he said it again. And uh, I knew he was also, of course, talking to me because I was the one at the breakfast table that he was saying it to. (laughs) And so I began to ponder the complexity of what he just told me. (laughs) But I, I see how it relates to the coming back to zero in a a way that I find more uplifting to live with than just the thought that whatever I'm enjoying I get to lose, which is really awful, even if true. It's not really, you don't want to wake up every morning and think, oh, I wonder what God's going to take away from me today that I love, right? It just doesn't, it's not happy, okay? But the, the coming back to zero is this. We were, and this is what we do every week in the Festival of Light, We were one with God. God sent us out on this mission. And we were supposed to be fruitful and multiply and that which we are given, we give to others. And that's our divine mission. You can ask the question behind it, whatever made God think it was a good idea to send us out on this mission. But I find that question unanswerable and I grow tired of questions I can't answer. So let's start with we're on the the road. So we're on the road and we have a job. We're... uh, an an ambassador of our Heavenly Father. And he says, share with others just as we have shared with you and we're such good little boys and girls and we gather all these good things and we pass it out to everyone and we are always looking back to our Heavenly Father and our Divine Mother and we're so proud of ourselves for carrying out our mission. But then what begins to happen to us, this is Swami says this more succinctly and more elegantly in the festival, is it gets to be kind of fun to be gathering stuff and giving it away. And we start thinking more about gathering stuff and giving it away, and then even more about just gathering stuff. And we forget to keep looking back to where we came from. And what happens is we forget our mission because we're entranced with the adventure of being ourselves. Hey, look, I may be my, the offspring of divinity, but I'm also <clears throat> me. And I enjoy being me. It's so wonderful being me and being the one who gathers and sometimes gives away and sometimes doesn't. Sometimes just keeps for myself because, after all, the more I have, the bigger I get. And we get, we get excited about this adventure and so we begin to move away. And we forget, and Swami puts it even farther, we, re, we forget that we have a mission and then we begin to rebel against that mission. We begin to feel slightly annoyed by the fact that instead of making myself wonderful and important, I'm supposed to be a part of all that is. But much of what is is icky. I don't really like you as much as I like me. And I don't really enjoy your happiness as much as I enjoy my own happiness. And we begin to revolt. And what we're revolting against is this sort of fundamental fact of, of creation, which is that I have a Heavenly Father and a Divine Mother, and just as they have shared with me, I am a part of all that is. And we revolt and they say, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just a part of my own little system, and I'm just going to take what I want and enjoy it. So what we've done is, from this one, we've started just pulling away. We've pulled away. And in the little allegory that Swami writes, We keep trying to make this work because on the surface of it, it seems like such a good idea, doesn't it? People think I'm wonderful. People praise me. People fear me. I can get what I want. I can indulge whatever impulses I have. Why would I have to pay attention to these old rules? This is the revolt. So we try it. And in the the Festival of Light, it says, so the little bird tried it. And he kept trying it. And I love this part, even though repeatedly he lost everything he had. And that is pretty much the sum story, isn't it? We, we keep thinking, if I can just get it lined up just exactly right this time, then this time I'll get to keep it. This time no one will betray me. This time no one will die. This time perhaps I won't die. Maybe I won't age. Maybe the ones that I want to love me actually will love me. And if they won't love me, I'll just punish them. And that'll be equally satisfying, won't it? And so we just keep trying. We've just declared our own system. 
And our own system is the world according to me, like this. And even though repeatedly we lost everything we had, Yogananda said so perfectly, reincarnation is not created. I mean, if everything goes horrible, who would want to reincarnate? And after those really ghastly lives, as those are not the ones when you want to come in. He said, the reason you keep coming back, and I love this, is because it almost works. It almost works. It's just so close to good that all we need is just one more small iteration. Satan is subtle. He's not stupid. So he makes it almost work. If only we hadn't had that argument. If only I'd gotten there in time, as Swami said. If only I'd kept my mouth shut. If only, if only, if only. Regret, longing. That's what brings us back over and over. So we regret something, we long for something, and we try it again. And what happens finally is that we, we start remembering whether we actually literally remember our past lives, which some people do, but on some vibrational level we start remembering. And I'm sure many of you have had some of the experiences that I had in my very early childhood where just something would break through. I remember my mother yelling at me <laughs> for something I had done, actually, scolding me, to be fair to my mother, just scolding me for something my brother and I were doing in the back seat of the car. And, uh, you know, and then there were no seat belts, so she would separate you. He would be on the seat, I would be on the floor. There were, when there were three of us, my sister would actually be on the shelf, you know, up above. My little sister on the shelf, my brother on the seat, me on the floor. And don't anybody touch anybody, you know, that's the mother would put you there. I remember being on the floor of the car, being scolded by my mother and having my feelings hurt. Not that I didn't deserve to be scolded, but I still had my feelings hurt. I didn't like it. And I consciously, I remember vividly thinking that if I go deep enough into myself, I'll find a place where this hurt no longer exists. And I don't know if it was exactly the same moment or not, but putting my ear down on the floor of the back seat car underneath there where you could hear the wheels, listening to the wheels. And what are you listening to? You're listening to the ohm sound. Just listening to that sound and going to the place where the hurt didn't exist anymore. And that was, I, how small was I? Small enough to fit in half of the floor of the back seat. That's pretty darn little. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. I'm sure all of you can talk about just knowing there's something out there. Because after enough incarnations of losing everything we have, it crosses our mind that maybe I don't know everything. Humility is the beginning of wisdom. And then Swami tells us we go to the quest. And the quest is the, the divine quest for the, for the Holy Grail, for, the, for the, uh, what we know really belongs to us and we very, very faintly remember that at some point we were manifested from infinity and we started this project and now it's not working so well. And so we begin to ask a very simple question, really, what is really going on here? And where does my happiness really come from? And what we have to understand, it's not to say that there's no joy in anything. Self-evidently, there's an enormous amount of joy in a great many things. Our love for each other, our love for our children, artistic creation, intellectual adventure, um, foreign travel, beautiful scenery. There's just many things about this planet that it, it, it doesn't serve us to turn our nose up at it and call it ugly when it isn't ugly. It's God's creation. But the question is much more of an internal one. Are we living our lives constantly trying to get away from that center point? of silence, stillness, and unity with the Spirit? Or are we living our lives always trying to live either from or in that point of stillness? And so even if God sends us out, and I, I tend to think of it in this way, this is how it's come into my own mind, the question is between freedom and compulsion. It's not so much what we do, it's whether we choose it out of freedom or whether we're compelled out of this terrible anxiety that I won't be happy unless I get this, or I will be happy if I don't. I mean, um, m most of my life decisions, some of them have been made in freedom, but many are made out of compulsion. It's like I'd like to think 
that I would do whatever God wanted me to do, but I'm just going to assume this is what he wants. I've made a number of very important decisions just having to say, honestly, I really don't even know if this is what God wants, but I don't have the capacity to make any other choice but this one. Because I'm compelled. I'm compelled by that memory of the revolt, which is what else is wisdom if not to take what is mine for myself. And so we do it again and again. And what has to come back to zero is that delusion in our mind that anything is inherently joy-producing. It doesn't mean that we can't experience joy in many different ways. But we have to come back slowly, slowly to that very simple single point that my joy is an expression of Divine Mother's presence within me. And I may take it into family life, I may take it into career, I may take it into art and music, but what am I taking? I'm always taking that that single one. That's where, you know, Swami's um, creative output was just startling. He was so prodigious, it was really um, impossible to explain it in a human way. And he never did explain it in a human way. Um, I'm going to go in it to another place and uh, come back to there. I, I, this, this, this idea came out of a, a spiritual novel that I read. It's called The House of Fulfillment. It was an old novel written um, at least maybe a hundred years ago. Very nice book, just a, a nice story if you like stories. And it was about English people who went to India and went to the mountains and found a master. And, and there was one character in there who became a very, uh, very famous artist as a sculptor, sculptor in, the, in the story. This is just fiction. But she described so vividly, she said what she had with her master in the Himalayas was a divine experience of, of infinity. And she knew she had a responsibility to share that experience of infinity. But she didn't know what form, at first, she didn't know what form it was going to take. Would she write poetry? Would she become a musician? Um, Would she be a dancer? And then as it happened, is more how she put it, she started making uh, marble statues. But she, standing where she was standing, at the point of relationship with infinity, she knew it made no difference at all what form it took. Because whatever form it took, it was going to be the same consciousness coming forward. And in Swami's life, that was exactly what he did. He stood, and he would always say this, I'm not a musician, I'm not a writer, I'm not an artist of any kind, I'm a disciple of a great master. I'm a disciple of a great master with a commission from him to carry his teachings out to all who would receive it. And so he would just stand in that discipleship. And I remember he started taking photographs. He said, I took photographs because we needed photographs and no one else was taking any that I thought really represented Ananda at that time. So he started taking photographs. And then he started taking photographs all around the world and then started using them for one purpose, which was to share his discipleship, to share his consciousness of the guru. Now, in an, a life as active as Swami Kriyananda's, where he touched hundreds of thousands of lives by this point, his books are in like 30 languages or so in 100 countries. Sometimes I think of some Polish factory worker sort of getting up in the morning and reading Education for Life in Polish, or someone in Russia reading Supportive Leadership, or someone in China reading Money Magnetism. I mean. We don't, we don't know these people. Swami will never have met these people. The book is not even in the language that he wrote it. But he gave out, from his center point of experience, this reality. And then it just goes on and on. And to a little bit, action in inaction, in action, in action. Swami wasn't moving. He was doing all of that work. And he was constantly putting out energy, but he never moved off his single center point. 
His single center point is, I am a disciple of a great master and I am here to serve him. And this is the simplicity in the complexity, the, life that, the lives that we are all called to. You know, it's just, there's so much. Sometimes I just get up in the morning and just, you know, going downstairs and see, cleaning up the dishes from last night and opening the refrigerator and seeing what's in there and then going to the grocery store. I mean, these are just the mundane parts of life. Everything is so complicated. Oh, I don't have any gas in the car. Oh, I lent the car to someone else. Oh, the battery on my electric bicycle isn't working. I don't have a shopping bag. Just long, 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 long like this. And that's not even the big stuff. That's just the trivial stuff. That doesn't even count the desperate longing of the heart for this and the terrible karmic confusion about that and the unresolved relationship over here. You just, well, that's why we keep coming back. Because we just get so spun out in the complexity. And the bringing it back to zero is not that it's all going to stop. Because I think Swami Kriyananda was standing as close to zero as I can imagine. I just, I, I, I can't evaluate his consciousness fully because I'm not his equal. But certainly from observing it as closely and as continuously as I did, I think it's about as close to zero as I can imagine. He'd never acted from compulsion. I mean, my vrittis, <laughs> my vrittis jump ahead of my decision-making process. <laughs> And I'm about to make a decision and my vrittis get in there first. My karma just, you know, makes me do something, compels me to do something. I never saw Swami, ever. Never. Not one time. Did I see him reacting to anything? He only responded. He stood at zero. But my goodness, he was busy. And so all of us who are made in the image of our masters... And Master himself was busy, busy, busy all the time, always doing something. He was commissioned by Babaji. He was commissioned by the Himalayan Masters. Those of us who get, and you can sign up at ananda.org for this today in history, and it tells you where Yogananda was and what he was doing. And right now he was doing a month-long course in Chicago. And, you know, he's doing one tomorrow or something about immortality, and the day before about perfect marriage, and tomorrow about money, and to how to find your best career, and the other one about healing. There's one, one that came about this healing program, and it said, bring your sick friends and relatives, <laughs> because Yogananda's going to heal them. I mean, he was in front of thousands of people doing miraculous healings. That's among the reasons why thousands of people came. You know, that was a, that was a, a good, uh, good way to get them in the door. And he did demonstrations of different pulses and different wrists or stopping the pulse in this one and keeping it going in this one and feats of strength. And he would call, are there any doctors in the house? He was so relaxed and easy and they'd come and examine him and he'd just, (laughs) child's play with this material plane. But it was all coming from him, from zero. Because never in his awareness did he forget I am an expression of the infinite. I am part of all that is. In this story, we have this skeptic who tries to get to prove that Swami Trilanga is uh, not genuine. And so he gives uh, gives him a bucket of poison. Can you imagine? I don't know what he expected. Did he expect to commit murder or what was he trying to do? Can you imagine that man? I love the, the idea of when you think of it from the other side. So he gives him this poison. I presume he thought that, I don't know what he thought. I'm going to presume nothing. So instead, the guy just chugs it down. Trilanga Swami didn't speak all that often, and he was 300 pounds, and he's sitting here drinking lime. And this guy is watching it. What, what does he think is going to happen? You know, my favorite expression for the <clears throat> many unfortunate things I've done in my life was, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, I wouldn't have done it if it didn't seem like it was going to bring me something I wanted. That's what all karma is about, isn't it? We think it's going to bring us something we want. Seemed like a good idea at the time. If I'd known better, would I have done it? Of course not. So this man watches Trilanga Swami drink this lime. And then just a few minutes later, the effect of it is right in his own body. Now, I mean, that's a quick way to learn something, isn't it? 
That's what Trilanga Swami said. He took away the intervening lifetimes before this poor man would have had to be poisoned. But instead, he just let him have it right now. Now that you have learned the divine meaning of boomerang. <laughs> God, I love it. I mean, he wasn't speaking English. So whatever language he was speaking, the divine meaning of the word boomerang, now you'll never do this again, will you? Oh, see, that's it for all of us. The d divine meaning of the word boomerang. Whatever energy we send out that is moving us away from our divine center, sooner or later we have to be pulled back to our divine center. And that's not the same as saying, if I want it, I have to lose it. If I was happy today, I'm mean tomorrow. No. If I forget God, then I have to be reminded of God. If I forget what my divine mission is, I have to be reminded of my divine mission. There's nothing in it, really, that even says we have to suffer. We tend to have to suffer because uh, even though repeatedly the bird lost everything he had, we learn slowly. I asked Swamiji once about something. Anyway, the reason we behave the way we do is because we're stupid. There's just really no other word for it. We're just stupid. We're not unteachable, though. That's the good news. We are capable of learning, but we learn very slowly. But all of us, we're all learning the divine meaning of boomerang, which is, I think I'm heading that direction, but in fact it's just going to whirl back on me. Because the only way to what we really want is to live more and more in the simplicity of who we really are. So I may lived in the simplicity of discipleship. And I, you, I think recently I was saying in here, Rajasi saying to Master, Master saying to Rajasi, his most advanced male disciple who had, this, had infinite consciousness, Master looked at him and said, don't forget where your power comes from. And Rajasi said, I know, sir, it comes from you. What Master was saying simply, in all that you're doing, bring it back to the simplicity. Wipe out all the contradictory thoughts and all karma comes to zero. But you see, that zero is actually shunya. That, that zero is the infinite zero, which is in that simplicity everything, everything, everything. This is the, this is really the, the last word. Every desire that we have by divine law must be fulfilled. And I'm not talking now about the desire for an ice cream cone that will teach you something. I mean the real desire, the single unquenchable desire to be loved, to be understood, to be known, to be respected, to endure, which is to say not to be lost. That, that's the true desire. And that will be fulfilled, oddly, though it seems to the mind, but not to the infinite, in the zero. God bless you.